Hello, thank you for being here. Uh, so I wanna recognize my thesis committee, Genevieve, Jacqueline, and Beth for their tireless and valuable support and guidance during this process. I couldn't have done it without them. So that being said, I'm excited to share with you the research that has both enlivened and challenged me over the past few months. So the epigraph that I'm sharing here, my epigraph wants to be shared, we're getting there, um, is by, um, when I began writing science fiction, when I began reading, heck, I wasn't in any of this stuff I read. I wrote myself in since I'm me and I'm here and I'm writing is by Octavia Butler, the late groundbreaking black science fiction writer of the Afrofuturism movement in literature, the visual arts, fashion and music. And that imagines a space of black creative and lived limitlessness. Butler's words inform the core of my thesis, which is about black women's visual art praxis as a form of Afrofuturist world building. And by world building, I mean the formation of a strategic and empowered response to the pervasive restrictive narratives of enslaved peoples, confined as it is to that act of enslavement, hopelessness, and powerlessness. I crafted my exegesis on Black women art praxis as world building around a set of contemporary artworks by Black women. And Wangechi Mutu's Water Woman, as we see here, uh, of 2017 is at the nexus of the consideration. So Water Woman is a life-size bronze sculpture of a black mermaid styled woman. She is exhibited outside along the banks of a pond on the grounds of Laguna Gloria at the Contemporary Austin Museum in Texas. Importantly, however, Mutu has created multiple editions of Water Woman located and displayed in different sites. This convertible or liminal aspect of Water Woman positions it as a figure of both freedom and fugivity. With Water Woman and works like it, Mutu performs what I call black world building, where she subtly transforms the confining structural narratives of enslavement and strikes ground upon which to build something anew, bridging the past to an unbounded future. So here we have a the cover. On the left, we have the cover of uh, a book by Mark Daly. Um, on the right, like a time traveler, we encounter Water Woman again, this time in the Des Moines Art Center Gallery. Mutu's Water Woman is emblematic of Afrofuturism's core belief that Black presence in art should not be incidental or overlooked, but should instead be centered. Its complexity, sovereignty, and liminality presumed. First cited as an official term in a 1994 book of essays, as we see here by Mark Derry, entitled Flame Wars, The Disclosure of Cyberculture, Afrofuturism includes various expressions of an Afro-speculative nature, encompassing such vast amorphous territory that it eludes precision of definitions and chronologies. As an Afrocentric counterpoint to traditional science fiction, whose landscapes in this and other imagined worlds were devastatingly white, Afrofuturism claims space, time, and history, and broadens the narratives that confine Black diasporic origins to the Middle Passage as a closed one-way trip of bondage. Characteristic of what I'm arguing as Black Afrofuturistic world building, with Water Woman Mutu gives material form to impossibility. The lustrous metal sheen of her back reflects the sun while its deep Black absorbs it. She is ever so slightly larger than life by virtue of the tail that rests behind her, an African mermaid in Texas, a water creature on land, yet as if by choice. Mutu's water woman is unambiguously black, the cast bronze of her skin, the style of her hair, her features. She is distinctly African, undeniably so. This helps to balance and yet positively reaffirm the liminal space that she inhabits as woman but not woman as both fish and human, as one associated with both the unknowable depths of the ocean, a world unto itself, and the conception of woman as an unknowable creature right here on terra firma. The surface of the figure is strikingly smooth. Its deep black seems to absorb everything around it as if to warn viewers that proximity carries the danger of an unexpected demise. This is only one of the ways in which she's created to feel unapproachable. Her form does not imply victimhood, but is self-protective and self-possessed in the face of our onlookers. Her body is upright, her arms are stretched tautly behind her. 
they prop her up in a posture that, depending on the position of the viewer, can appear to be either repose or confrontation. When viewed from behind, the water woman appears to be comfortable in her own position of liminal potential. That potential does not simply radiate outwardly. It is complicated by a viewer's projection onto the figure. Thus, the patina of water woman's skin is a surface upon which both those projections and the light can reflect. The apparent ability of the work to both absorb and reflect light is almost disconcerting and is one of the ways in which the viewer is frequently left feeling a sense of imbalance. Her gaze is penetrating and her mask-like eyes have the appearance of being narrowed and one can wonder extensively about this expression. Is it done in accusation, curiosity, haughty disdain? Is she unaccustomed to the lights or the sun? So Mutu's rendering sits in stark contrast to traditional images of mermaids and sea nymphs with long flowy manes, as we see here with Botticelli's Birth of Venus. Um, so her hair is both African and hydrodynamic, resembling Bantu knots come undone. Each piece stands apart from her head in sharp points and distinctly defined sections. The main section is centered at the top of her head and in line with her nose. It is symmetrical, bisected by a line down the middle. Coming to a sharpened tip, it appears as both dorsal fin and spear. One imagines it cutting through the water, allowing her to glide with speed and intention. And yet it also brings her a greater advantage in that she's given the benefit of stealthier moves. Within an oceanic context, her fin-like hair serves as a cloaking device that makes her invisible and much more dangerous as she approaches her targets. In an early version of Water Woman, Mutu fashioned her head seemingly to accommodate multiple readings. It could be seen as resembling that of a squid, which would allow us to understand her as having these underwater beginnings. The second reading could see her as a waterborne chimera with outer planetary roots and who dwells in Earth's ocean waters because it's so similar to the atmosphere of her own home planet. And while both of those readings would depict beings that are outside of us as embodied humans, yet a third reading would place Water Woman again into a context that begins with the ancient widespread cultural tradition of cranial manipulation. Whatever the chosen reading, if seen strictly from a Western standpoint, she could be considered a universal other. Yet both Mutu's previous and final iterations of the bronze figure steep her firmly in blackness that expresses qualities and ancient practices that persist today. Moving freely through a matrix of possibilities, the visuality of Water Woman's head makes her the brethren of Benin royalty, as it has a striking, resem striking resemblance to the ancestral heads of the powerful Iyoba queen mothers of the Benin kingdom of West Africa, centered at Benin city in current day Nigeria, and whose origins go back almost a millennium. In the 16th century, in her prominent and influential role as the first Iyoba queen Edia here on the left, um, she created a signature hairstyle that all successive queen mothers then wore. Her hair rose over her head in a slight curve that ended in a point. From the front, from the, front the hair appears to be a tall crown, an element that Mutu repeats in the rising crown-like hair as Finn of Water Woman. It's a truism within some, of, some areas of the African diaspora that ancestors and gods enter through the head. So the visual likeness between these auspicious figures of black womanhood is another sign of the dynamics of Black aesthetic and conceptual nimbleness characteristic of Black Afrofuturist world building. Mutu, gives further, Mutu goes further to align these beings across space and time. And as I discuss in my project, the Ioba Queen Motherhead is among the famed Benin bronzes embroiled in debates about the West still being in possession of African cultural heritage. Thus, Mutu's forming of water woman in bronze as Benin artists once formed the the Ioba Queen mother heads feels like not only the creation of an art object, but the reclamation of a stolen African history. In closing, I want to pivot to another example of Mudu's strategy of Afrofuturistic world building in her collage painting on vinyl work Beneath Lies the Power, a work that illustrates the liminal female figure of hybridity, liminality, and the power of transmutation. Stars flicker and blur like eyes held too long on lights. Night heightens consciousness. Daylight blinds us to our place in the cosmos. Four curved beaked birds look out from her nested crown. The two brightest stars in the sky just above her head geometrically aligned with her left eye. And the edges of her lashes are mirrored by the two stars and the limbs 
sprouting from her scalp, a fertile crown. This alignment alludes to her stardust com composition. Snake skin supports her, slithering down her spine. She is comprised of disparate human parts, primates, leaves, cut meat, hair, fur, gems, cellular processes. She is clearly material, a land dweller. Similar to Water Woman's above ground installation at Laguna Gloria, she is flanked by nature on each side, creating a sense of stability and regality. But underneath, she is supported and transported by a dark marine body, the true engine of her power. She reminds us that the subliminal speaks to us within. It is the fuel that ignites the spark of action, conscious or otherwise. She is the reminder that before and after the flesh is ether, and that while embodied, we hold this knowing that, knowing but unformed presence within us. Complementary darkness is always present, but quite often unbidden. It is that which we consciously or subconsciously choose to keep sequestered. But as Beneath Lies the Power illustrates, her acknowledgement and integration of her darkness is the source of her power, the vehicle for her transformation. It is always there, under the surface, and yet she appears to be at peace with this arrangement, unburdened, the shadow symbiotically unbothered by her passenger. Thank you.